Okay. And I thought because um, I'm sharing some of Lefty's uh, wit and wisdom that I might share. You want to hear my favorite Lefty Cray story? Sure. Okay. It happens when he was uh, he was a great mentor for me and so many others, and and so much of his wit lives on, uh, and his influence carries on, and his legacy continues. But this story comes from when he was in the starts when he was a combat a combat uh, soldier in World War II. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge, and um, he uh, he still had a couple of months left over on his hitch after he got sent back home. And so they assigned him close to his home to Fort Detrick, but the only openings they had of all things was working uh, as a specialist in a biological weapons factory. Yeah. And so he and three other enlisted uh, people, their job was to clean out the vats of, uh, of anthrax after every run, after every batch they did. He was, uh, and the two others were, were that their task was to clean out all of the equipment and all three of them got anthrax and two of them died. And obviously Lefty survived, but he was six weeks in the hospital during which time they were working uh, and perfecting their weapon, but they also, by harvesting his antibodies, they kind of had the antidote to it. So not only did they have their weapon, but through Lefty Cray's donation, they had the antibodies to fight it as well. So he got the dubious honor of having our first weapons grade anthrax strain named after him, okay? You can't make this stuff up, it's true. I, I read it on the internet. <laughs> and so <laughs> it is true though um he survived he got out of hospital and he talks to his mentor in out in the outdoor world joe brooks the editor at, at field and stream and he said hey joe i need a job i got out of the service i'm out of the hospital i'm doing fine incidentally that strain of anthrax is called bbk1 right which stands for bernard victor cray so now he's got a job. Joe says, okay, what do you want to do? Um, Lefty says, well, the only thing I know how to do is hunt and fish. And then Joe says, well, you could be a writer. And Lefty said, I barely graduated high school. I don't know how to write. <laughs> and Joe said, well, that's what editors are for. Okay. And so he lined up his first job uh, at, the, at the Baltimore Star and the Miami Herald. One of his first assignments was to go down to Cuba and cover this international angling tournament for saltwater fish. And anglers had come over and their teams had come from all over the world and collected in Havana to fish this three-day tournament. They had a lot of local islanders work in the tournament as well. And Lefty had the only press badge there and it got him everywhere. And so on the second day, he's walking down the dock and he decides, I'm gonna see where I can go with this press badge. And he jumps on a boat and he fishes all day with Fidel Castro. Like I said, you can't make this stuff up. It's, be uh, it, 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 it's better than fiction. So anyway, I guess Fidel turns out to be a halfway decent fisherman. Um, and at the end of, uh, of that day, the next day, he's walking down the dock. This is the last day of the tournament now, and everybody's going to go home. The, all the anglers are going to go back to wherever they came and start their journeys home. And all the islanders will be home that night. And Lefty's walking down the dock, and he sees the name on the back of this boat. And it's the Pilar. And so he fishes all day with Ernest Hemingway. Okay, it's true. It is true. And so he walked back and here's Santiago, the first mate, whipping through the mullet for the day's fishing like a surgeon preparing the bait. And of course, Santiago is he who Hemingway made the protagonist in The Old Man in the Sea. It was after his first mate, Santiago. And so they're out there and they're fishing and, and it gets a little slow mid-morning and everybody starts to kind of mill around. And so Lefty walks up on the boat and he asks Ernest, he said, you know, Ernest, I'm a brand new writer. And he looks at him and says, and you're a pretty good writer. <laughs> Maybe you could give me a few tips. And so he gets writing tips from Ernest Hemingway. And Hemingway goes, okay, what do you want to know? And and Lefty goes, I, maybe you could just tell me what makes good writing good. What is good writing? The definition of good writing. And Hemingway, he strokes his literary beard and he goes, hmm, you know, well, good writing because you make it worse by either adding or subtracting. 
fantastic. Good writing cannot be edited. And Lucky goes, that's amazing. That's going to help me so much. And so at lunchtime, they're all kind of gathered in the back of the boat, and the islanders are talking about going home that night, and everybody's getting a little homesick. All the anglers are going home that day, and they're talking about home and swapping stories of their families. And this one islander opens up his lunch, and for each of the five days he had been away from home, his wife made him a lunch. And on this last day, he opens up his lunch, and there's a note in there from his wife. And he reads it, and he blushes, and he puts it right back down in his lunch pail. And Lefty saw this. He can't let this go. So he said, let me see that note. And so the guy rather reluctantly and she hands over this note to Lefty, and Lefty opens it up and reads it. And it said, there's going to be some loving in this here shack tonight, whether you use home or whether you isn't. Hemingway goes, that's good writing. Okay. He was quite a guy. We all miss him anyway. There's Fidel and, and Hemingway. Uh, he was a mentor to so many of us and, and uh, beloved by everyone in our sport. But let's talk about what, how to get to that 10%. It starts with something very simple but very fundamental is making the decision to do it and committing yourself to it. Uh, mindset is the most important thing. When you go to the river, go to practice. Too often we just get caught up in it. We just start fishing. We don't pay attention. We're not observant, and we just uh, start casting and, and, and uh, trying to catch fish. But really, it starts with going to the river to practice. Make sure every cast is on target. Make sure your drift is accurate and correct. Don't just be haphazard and mindless and do what you've always done. Decide to be like the athlete. We need to take an athletic approach to it. It's not a pastime. It's a sport. And as an athlete, they, we see the game-winning free throw, but we didn't see tens of thousands in the gym that they did to practice to make that free throw when it mattered. And that's a kind of a mindset that we need to bring to it. We need to be disciplined and decide that we're going to do that. Um, and the other 90-10 rule is a couple 90-10 rules that we're going to talk about. But we have to start with the fact that 90% of the trout are really in 10% of the water. You've heard that, right? right? Okay, so we're going to learn to identify that 10%. But if we build on that just more to fish productive water, what that really means is that we should spend 90% of our time on 10% of the water. And we fail to sometimes make that next step connection is let's not be spending much time on non-productive water. I'm going to give you an illustration here in just a moment of what that really looks like. And the first time I was really exposed to that was out on the ocean when I got to Belize and I looked at all this water and I said to the guide, where do you fish? Well, he said, you know about the 90-10 rule, about knowing where to look. I got to stand closer to this. Let's not quite reach him. And so um, can everybody see if I stand here? Okay. So he said, okay, eliminate 90% of the water. OK, and that narrows it down a lot. He said, well, look for this and look for that. Look for shallow transition. The deep water and channels and cuts and tide flows and stuff like that. And that made it a lot simpler. And he said all that to me right before I caught the world's smallest bonefish. And <laughs> he's holding it like a sardine. He could have just done it like in hell to the camera, right? But, you know, he's not helping me here. But anyway, eliminate that 90 percent of the water. Let's take an example give you a different way to approach reading water something i want to think of you something relatively novel and it's just something that we're starting to see emerge in our sport now it's reading the water based on food type okay say i've got a trico spinner fall i'm going to look for uniform and decelerating currents okay i'm not going to look for the heads of currents i'm not going to look for the roughest broken water but I'm gonna look for an area where there's a decelerating current for trichos, okay? That's what I'm gonna key in. Now, if it's bluing out, it's just the opposite. Bluing out is like here that are still on the surface and there might be some trout back here, okay? But the best activity and the best fish and the greatest numbers are gonna be accelerating part of that water. Does that make sense? That's where the action the main event is that's where your best 
fish will be. So fish that are back here sifting, they're probably more subordinate fish, maybe smaller, lower on the pecking order. The best fish are going up here where the activity is happening, where the nymphs are actually coming from the bottom to the surface. And they're vulnerable at that point. Those best fish are going to be at the head where there's an accelerating current. Now, if it's, if it's something like hoppers, I like pails uh, of foam for hoppers back in here. I think that's a good hopper spot. I like that a lot. Okay. Now, if it is a post hatch or a spinnerfall, I'm going to go find the, a river bed. Okay. And I'm going to fish as this water is coming to you, all of the foam and all of the cripple uh, emergers or spent spinners they a cluster along the outer bank at the tail back end of a river bend back here we see foam on the inner bank it's all an outer bank that's where we put our hoppers too right for the same reason floating food ends up here in the dust bin of this river right here does that make sense and the reason that happens is because water doesn't just track around a river bend it rolls around a river bend like this that's why we see river bends that are always enlarging. The outer bank is always excavated. It's excavated by this rolling current and it pulls all that to the inner bank, which is low and shallow. So the outer bank is excavated and hot, the bend like this, just like this. What that does, you can't see here uh, because is there any way to move that down here? Okay. Okay, but there is an arrow here this rolling helical current creates a, uh, a cross current at the surface that pushes all of the food out to here. And it creates a cross surface, a cross current at the bottom that brings all of the subsurface food to here. Those are two depositional dump zones, okay, for water. And that's created by these helical currents that create cross currents. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? You can't all see the entire screen. But that cross current pushes all the floating food there. Okay, it's feeding opportunities on the surface along the outer bank and the back half of the bank of the river bend, and then it creates subsurface uh, feeding here. So I'm always going to put my, uh, you know, my post uh, uh, hatch or post spinnerfall dry flies back along here. Um, that's, uh, that's where we'll see the most feeding activity. This one, like, here's a driftless stream. Here's the water coming to us. Here's the inner bank here, no foam. Watch all the foam accumulate up here. It stacks up here. You can see the current right there. Diag sipping trout at the end after a, a, a hatch or a spinner fall. Okay. Now, what do you do? then when there is no predominant food type maybe there isn't something that the trout are really keyed on how do we break down water then well we're going to break it down then like a competitive angler we're going to identify a water and b water okay and this is that same stretch of water that we looked before in the example the same stretch where the water is moving towards us if we look at A water, I still consider that A water no matter what the food type is, okay? I like this a lot as A water. I also see A water here where we thought of a good hopper spot, okay? I like that there. I also like this spot here because I've got the intersection of several different small channels and braids that are coming here and dumping food from multiple feeding lanes in one location. I think that's pretty good water too. And then after we've do, looked at the A water, okay, I'm gonna identify B water. I like that edge seam. I like that spot there, okay. And I do like this spot up here too. Um, I think there could be some good, good trout there. And that's where I'm going to spend 90% of my time. Okay, I'm going to spend 10% of my time for the rest of the water. That doesn't mean there may not be fish here. And if I can get a, a good enough presentation for nymph fishing, I could still catch them here. But again, we're looking for the best trout and the most abundant um, uh, uh, locations and get there. Anybody else see it differently? So that's the way I'm going to look at it. And that's where I'm going to focus the bulk of my fishing time. Okay, 90% of my fishing is only going to be in 10% of the water. Okay, that's really, really important. Here's another driftless stream. Um, I like transition zones. Transition zones are trout magnets. What are we calling 
a transition zone. What do we mean by a transition zone? Well, a transition zone is, is characterized by a change in current speed and a change in water depth, okay? All of that food that's being lifted and powered up from the bottom of the stream in that fast water is being carried in the current. And then that, as that current starts to slow down, all of that food starts to, to descend and, and starts to gravitate down. And all those trout are lined up behind the, the depth change behind that but eating so i like i like transition zones as being trout magnets i see a major feeder. i see a secondary feeding lane here i think i could find trout stacked up all through here i like this whole outer bank especially after the intersection of these two uh, main feeding lanes i look for feeding lanes and then i look for trout positions so I, I could fish of water, you know, just maximizing what that has to offer. And you could expect us to catch fish after fish. Transition zones are trout magnets. Look for the change in current speed. Look for the change in water depth. But also, if we take it one step further, it also tells you how to fish. Okay, it tells me how, where to set up for angles, and it tells me how to fish this. If I'm nymph fishing, those people in the nymph fishing class will know that we're never going to use a suspension or flotation device through transition zone because they won't follow the contour of the bottom as the depth changes. Okay, I want some type of a direct connection, high sticking or your nymphing technique that will allow me to track through the shallow water and then lower my flies into the trout's mouth as I pass through the water chain in, in depth. That makes sense. Reading the water tells you where to fish and why also tells you how to fish with method to choose. Okay, we can get the most out of it. Here's another driftless stream. We all share the same home waters, by the way. I'm just a, a little southwest is all. Um, but here's another nice transition zone. I like the edge seam along these uh, this main feeding lane through here. I like this pocket water creating some, some new structure here. And again, I've got a tight line uh, European nymphing style set up here so that I can change and, and track the change, uh, track the bottom of the stream as it changes depth. Another transition zone, South Platte River in Colorado. Again, look at these as far as lifting up the food and then they're going to be dumping that food all along these edge seams trout will be lined up again eating voraciously if you just focus on transition zones you'll see your catch rate go up that is definitely part of that 10 percent of the water I like depressions too anytime there's a depression here uh, pockets channel depressions all those things are really really good for holding trout as well also, these become oxygenators as that water temperature creeps up into the 60s because this introduces air into the water and uh, warm water doesn't hold as much air or oxygen in it and doesn't hold it for as long downstream. So trout will move up closer to the source of oxygen in warm water too as those temperatures rise. So become a student of the water. Take a look. Take a moment. My buddy Ed Engel, also one of the nymph masters, he, he rigs his rod by by the stream side so that he's eating trout for rises for flashing trout underwater see if there's any bugs look for the primary and secondary feeding lanes and he's kind of mapping out a strategy he's sitting there so sometimes it's, you just don't want to just jump right in and uh, and start fishing uh, take a moment to rig up because oftentimes the great temptation is just to jump right in and then we end up spooking a bunch of fish right all right okay focus on presentation too we talked about this this afternoon afternoon in class, you're going to catch more fish with the wrong fly and the right presentation than you will with the perfect fly that's presented poorly. Okay, presentation trumps fly selection unless there is some type of event, a hatch, a spinnerfall, or something that has tightened their prey focus to only one food type, and then they're going to be keyed in on that. The rest of the time, they'll feed more indiscriminately than we give them credit for. And that means they'll take a wider variety of flies. Um, and I think then if we present them well, we're still uh, going to see our catch rate. And I change my presentation. I'll change something that I'm doing before I change flies. And I'll ask myself the question, if I'm nymph fishing, did I get my flies down there in front of the trout? Or did I not? Did I not meet those three goals of nymph fishing? And that's really, really important. So sometimes it's hard, though, especially if you're trying to net a fish from up there, right? <laughs> but let's start by making the first, if I'm approaching a new stretch of water, my first, uh, if I'm doing dry flies or nymphs, my first presentations are gonna be true dead drifts. 
and I'm going to make sure that they are dead drift and drag free. We're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get into some leader ideas. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to try some type of some type of an animate in our Wisconsin um, uh, driftless streams. And look how he's fishing this dry fly. Okay, he's going to cast it upstream and across. It's right here. Look at the high rod position. Look what he's doing now. Look at him shake the rod tip to make that fly by dance and skitter across the surface. He's also drawing line in with his left hand or his line hand. But look at the high rod position. Look what it's doing to his fly. That is a, a turn button for trout. One more, we'll take a look at it where you can see what he's doing and the result it's getting. Skittering it across the surface, shaking it, vibrating. You can catch another several fish out of that pool after he's already caught a few on the dead drift. So activate that. It's easier to do that with longer leaders. A lot of people are resistant to throw longer leaders. That was a 12 foot leader. Um, but really, um, I'm going to show you a way to make that much easier when we get into matching lines, rods, reels, and leaders. So dry dropper with long leaders is it's really, really the take thing for dry fly fishing, especially in our waters where it is, uh, we have a lot of spooky fish we don't want to throw. It's much easier for us to lift that leader from the water than it is the fly line itself. So let's start. Um, this is the, the, the rig that I use for the driftless streams. And um, then I'm going to show you a large stream rig as well. But just some consent stuff here at the beginning, having the right tool, which means the right combination for my for my fishing circumstance for that day. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break it down by a small stream or a spring creek, like a driftless stream or a larger river because my goals are different. I'm gonna ask my combination to perform differently and do different things in each of these situations. Okay, let's get into that. There are different tools for the jobs. Okay, this is my son and grandson. And we're fishing some of the Iowa driftless. This is the last up here. But essentially, when I'm fishing a larger body of water, a larger river, I need a faster action rod to be able to get a longer cast, but also be able to mend at distance. I need something that's going to lift that line up when there's of line up. I don't need that when I'm fishing with stream smaller uh, creeks, but I action a little bit longer, a little bit more or haft in the mid part of that rod to help me mend all that line, okay? But when I get on our small spring creeks uh, here, then it's entirely different. I want a, a, maybe a medium fast rod, maybe a softer rod even, um, and, a, and maybe, you know, maybe it's only eight foot six instead of nine or, or greater. So I'm, uh, by doing so, by going to that medium action rod, you'll see your roll cast, you'll add 10 feet to your roll cast just by going to the right, uh, the right rod for the roll cast, which is when you get back in that position with a, with a nice mid flex rod, when you're ready to load that, that loads all the way into the spine of the rod for your forward stroke. If you've got a fast action rod and you're gonna to try to do a roll cast, you're only loading the tip. It won't load as completely or as quickly as a mid flex uh, rod. Does that make sense? Having the right rod is the key to making a good roll cast, okay? And then let's add fly lines to that pair too. And let's talk a little bit about fly lines because fly lines have come a long way. They're also very confusing when you go to pick new lines. And let's just see if we can make that a little bit simpler by matching the line <clears throat> through the rod and reel in the circumstance that we're asking it to do. Okay. We did, again, we have different goals and needs. My small water preferred, uh, preferred, preferred line is scientific English creek trout. Okay. okay, that's got an aggressive 30 foot head. Okay, so, so I'm using a, and I'm casting only 30 feet probably max, but I can make that leader, that long leader will actually unroll and lie perfectly down because I have, even though I'm only using 15 feet of the head, it's a very aggressive head. Okay, and it has enough mass to turn over that long leader, even when I'm only using a short part of the head. Okay, and that really, you want to make another 10 feet on your roll cast, 
put that line on it, okay? It's gonna add another 10 feet on your roll cast just by getting the right line to do that. Okay, it's a short range line. It's not designed to cast 75 feet. Okay, it's short, but heavy had 30 feet is what it is. And it's great for those longer leaders that I like to fish in our small spring creeks. A lot of people think I'm crazy for fishing a 12 foot um, leader in a, in a stream that's only 15 feet wide, but you'll be amazed at what your catch rate will do. Your drifts will be better um, and you'll catch more fish. You're not gonna put off as many fish by lining them, which is passing our line over their heads. So again, um, it's great for roll cast, as we said, but if I go on to uh, a larger river, it's all different. Cortland also makes one. This is a 36 foot head. It's called their, their Trout Boss series. It's another short. I need to cast it further. I need to shoot line further. I need to mend from distance. You can't mend behind the head. You have to mend in the head. And so you can mend from greater distance with these longer lines. It's a much longer head, longer cast. It will also um, shoot line well for you, gives you line control at distance, and it'll also throw junk. Like if you're throwing um, some type of a flotation device and heavy weights or something like that, it will handle that pretty well. The the other Cortland equivalent then is their long belly distance line, which is a really good line as well. I don't care which one you buy, um, but these are my, would be two great choices then um, for that type of a situation. Nymphing, if I'm nymphing all day, I'm going to use a specific line for that, uh, usually with no head at all. Very specialized for nymphing itself. It really has uh, completely level. It's usually 0.022 inches in diameter. There's no head, no mass but it does give me excellent control over presentation and activating or uh, animating my drifts. It's really, really easy to do that um, with that type of a line. So SA uh, product, um, Cortland has an equivalent to, um, I do like the braided core for both of these better than the monocore. Okay, they're a little easier. So I use a lot of reels uh, with spare spools so that I can go back and forth different lines. Uh, you know, go back uh, according to the circumstance that you face. My small stream pair would include one reel uh, or spare spool that's lined up with uh, with that uh, creek trout line from SA. I would also have one lined up for nymphing. And then if I'm going to the uh, larger river, larger uh, bodies of water, I'm going to have a floating line with a long head. I'm also going to have a streamer line, then I also will likely have a, a nymphing line as well. How are we doing with that? Any questions on that? How are we, are we doing good? Okay, that's my buddy. I'm on the road so much, especially during fly fishing show, show season. I'm usually only home a few days a month, and so I miss my dog a lot. <laughs> if you have dogs, you know, that's a German wire hair pointer. Do you? Oh, yeah, they're fun. I got a lot of personality. So my wife travels too, and she has her two dogs too. So I'm always texting my wife at night. Hi, honey, how are you? Send me a picture of the dog. You know, and I guess he's got on, on my spot on the couch. I think he's got in my liquor too. Looks like he's passed out there. He's been over. Anyway, okay. We're good on, on all of that. Let's jump into leaders and talk about leaders for a little bit. Uh, and I am going to... Uh, I'm not going to disrespect commercially made leaders, but I'm going to show you advantages and disadvantages for all these products, okay? And really, let's just start with some simple stuff. Let's talk about what does a leader do? It has two main functions. It's got to reduce in diameter, right, from, from the thicker part that we tie onto our line or put on our loop connection down to the fly. But, but it also has to transfer energy from that cast to get that fly to unfurl and land on the water, right? So it has two major functions um, in a leader. And the leader composition that you're gonna see commercially is very standard, okay? It's very standard. The first 60% is thick butt material, okay? It's usually very level uh, to 60%. So that means six feet of a nine foot leader is going to be, you know, five and a half feet is going to be level, okay? Then you get to 20% of taper, and then you have 20% of terminal, whether it's 4X, 5X, or whatever it is. This will be level at that uh, terminal uh, diameter. This will be level, um, and this will be your taper. So all your taper is concentrating into one very small segment. Where does the energy transfer failure occur? 
in that taper section. When your task fails, it fails at the taper because the energy did not transfer through that tapered section. So you end up with a pile on the water feed of material, and that's a, a tangle waiting for happen, waiting to happen. And so where we do want slack is right in front of our fly, but not all, all the way through our taper section. So that's our energy loss segment. And this is all hard nylon. The same hard nylon that's up here that's so stiff and rigid is also here at a thinner diameter, but it's just as stiff and rigid as the upper section is too. And that's not what we want to tie our flies to because that's too restrictive. It creates an artificial influence in that fly. It, it, it interferes with the fly's ability to navigate with the small scale nuances of current, right? So that creates a small scale drag. It prohibits our fly from, from acting like a free floating uh, dead drifting insect. And so this is a stiff nylon. It, it has a lot of memory. It's very, very stiff. And if you ever see your dry fly tilting over with the loop of, uh, of uh, mono in front of it, that's the problem. Okay, maybe you tied the fly fine. We always think, well, I tied that fly crooked. Well, no, you just put it onto hard nylon leader, which is not the best way to do it. Okay, and that's not going to entice many fish. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to have a soft fin connection um, to our fly, not attach it directly to the leader. So do we eliminate the hard nylon and just add soft tippet? Some people have started to do that where they're adding three feet or something like that of softer material to the fly. And that does solve the problem of being softer to the fly. But what you've done then is you essentially created two points of collapse because now the leader wants to fail in two different locations. And now it lands in a tangled up mess and you pick it up and it's a wind knot or a mess. And you think, wow, I'm a bad caster. Well, maybe you are, but maybe not. Okay, maybe it's just what happens if we hook it up that way. And that's not the best way to do it. Okay, so another improvement then is, okay, let's cut off this level section of, of hard nylon and directly tie our fly with softer material right after the taper. And that is a big improvement, okay? But it's still not the best way to do it, but it's improve it a lot. And what I like, I like the um, SA product, um, the the absolute fluorocarbon or uh, their monofilament. I love this stuff. It is, uh, it is really strong and uh, yet really thin. I mean, 7X, five years ago, if you could find it, 10 years ago, would only be 1.6 um, pounds in test. So our products have gotten so much better, allowing us to be thin and supple without sacrificing um, our, uh, our um, uh, tippet breaking strength. So this is the, the leader that I like to make, okay? And it's one that hand knotted all the way down with smaller incremental uh, reductions in length and test strength diameter all the way down to a tippet ring. If you could actually see it down below here, you would see that I'm putting several feet, usually not in our small spring creeks. Now I'm not gonna go four to five, I might go two feet, okay? And what I have done is I've got all this hard nylon down to the tippet ring, and this is very efficient in transferring energy to the tip. And then I put a foot or two of down here. That's where my collapse occurs, putting slack right in front of my fly, which is where I want it, without giving me the tangle prone pile that I would get otherwise. Does that make sense? So I'm controlling where this leader is going to collapse by putting... Uh, uh, this transition, not only in diameter, but also in material stiffness. So I can put the slack right in front of the fly to get that perfect drift, okay? And it's not that hard to make, okay? Because this segment here, this is my standing leader. And I make that once a year, okay? This is my wear section down below the tippet ring. And that's a couple feet, usually not four to five on our small streams because that will waffle because that's collapsing. I don't want to lose my fly in the bushes and I'd lose control. Or if it's windy, I'll be down even shorter. But two feet for our small streams uh, here is about right. But this is my wear section that I change periodically. I change it all the time because it gets abraded, it gets chewed on, it gets shortened as I change flies. I keep the same standing part of my leader all year. So I really only have to tie 
these, uh, these uh, half a dozen knots or so here. It doesn't take me that long. So usually I tie one a year, and it's usually during the, uh, the Bears game home opener. And it, it takes me about 20 minutes to tie up that leader, and the game's over after 20 minutes anyway. So, so. <laughs> Um, if, if I'm going to uh, add my flies or uh, split it into two flies, I would do it down here is the question. And we can, we'll get into rigging, I think, in a little bit as well. But um, I only talk a year, okay, because it's hard, durable material. It, it's, it, it lasts the whole time. Here's my large river um, one, okay, and it's just a little bit different. It ends with a little bit higher test strength and it has a little bit thicker up here because I need a better energy transfer for that longer range cast. You'll be amazed at how well this performs for roll cast. It's a very energy efficient leader. And if you glue your knots with Zappa Gap glue to smooth them out, they can come in and out of your eyes relatively easily without hanging up so that you don't have to shake them out every time you go to recast. We don't want that either. Or better yet, go online and get uh, Dave and Emily Whitlock's direct connection tool and do a direct connection uh, between your uh, butt section of your leader to your line and you eliminate any knot there at all. It's just a direct splice. I can show you one, I've got one in the, in the Jeep. So again, trying to get rid of those, um, you know, those knots is gonna be good. Okay, let's keep going. Also, when you're constructing your leaders, remember the rule of 11. Right? Anybody know the rule of 11? Okay, that's important if you're going to start doing your leaders, is that the rule of 11 means that the X nomenclature here subtracted by from 11 equals your 0 0.05 inches. So if you take 11, if you take point, uh, point 0.5, 5 and 6 is 11, 5 and 6 is 11, 4 and 7 is 11. It's called the rule of 11. It's pretty universal for all domestic manufacturers that the X factor rating is based on, on the diameter. And the, usually the two of them add up to 11. And so when you're making incremental changes, you don't want to make more than two jumps. So you could go 4X to 6X, but you couldn't go 3X to 6X. Okay, that's kind of the rule where it becomes important. So the X rating and diameter in hundreds of inches add up to 11. Okay, different rings, I'm a big believer. Lever and tippet rings. I like them to split flies. I terminate my uh, fanning part of my leader with it. And then I always zap a gap my, my knots, all of them, all the way down to the tippet ring. I don't do it to the fly, obviously. I don't do it below. My head. <laughs> I end up with my fingers glued together. Do you, you're laughing, Bob. <laughs> but that's that happens, right? So yeah, okay, but glue your knots, not necessarily because we need additional knot security, but they will slide in and out of your guides if you just kind of feather them out a little bit with glue, okay? And that makes it a lot better. UV knot sense is fine too, you can do that. Rigging and knots, and let's talk just a little bit about that. Um, double surgeon's knot is certainly a good way to split flies. So we're talking about now in the wear section of my leader, that softer material that comes below my tippet ring to my flies. If I'm gonna split flies, you can certainly use a double surgeon's knot, but the way it works out when you tie this, is, um, is uh, you know, you, we want our dropper off the thinner material. And so sometimes if you just put a half hitch over here, it will come out at the right angle because we want our dropper off of this one. So just throw a half hitch and snug against there and it will ride against that knot and it will prevent that from, uh, it will reduce your spins and tangles at a half hitch right there. And you'll find that it's more tangle free. Here's a 1620 knot, it's now, um, the knot that most of our competitive anglers are tying. What I like about it is it's really easy to tie. You can tie it blindfolded almost. It disappears. Um, you'll see how small the profile of this knot is. Uh, and I'll play this video for you. Uh, it has excellent knot security. I don't have many failures from knots on this. And I can also really reduce my waist. Um, by, I can reduce my waist to about a half of an inch. Here's the 1620 knot, okay? It's a, it's a loop up to create a, a loop and then four wraps around the two segments. Okay, your standing part and then your tag part. Pass that through the loop. Okay, wet it down. All knots should be wetted and then slide it into place. It is that quick. There's all kinds of uh, tutorials online for that. 
look at this look how thick that material is but the knot disappears that is such a small knot if i tie an improved clinch knot on a size 18 fly all i see is a knot it's huge it's bigger than your fist right this knot virtually disappears 1620 it's all over the internet uh, there's a lot of tutorials on it but i like the way it it really disappears but look at the waist i can get my waist down to half that much so if i'm tying on tags where i'm I'm really limited in the in the length. I can tie multiple tags off of the same one because I'm eliminating or reducing my my waist. I get more ties. I was in uh, Cuba, and I'm always learning. We're all learners in this sport, and I learned a new loop knot from our guide in Cuba. So I did I did um, video this from two different angles, and I'll play those for you now. So while I use a loop knot is for streamers mostly. But watch this loop knot. It's kind of a takeoff on the perfection loop. If you can tie a perfection loop, this knot will be very easy. And so we're just doing a, a back loop, feeding your fly through the tag, and then tie a perfection loop around. He's going to do it again. So we're going to go around that with the fly dangling, and then between the two loops, open up the big loop like that, drop the fly in and through and then tighten it down and look at that loop knot Is that pretty here's another view of it i think it's actually better okay create your loop put your streamer fly through it around pinch through so again you're going to do it again around and between pinch it down and open that up drop the fly through And that's it. Is that a beautiful little easy quick tie? Pretty cool. I don't know what the name of it is. He's Arnold. We should call it Arnold's knot. Isn't that a cool knot though? If you can tie a perfection loop, you can tie that new streamer loop. Some of the other loop connections and ties that we have are so complicated, you got to get the book out to tie them. This one you can remember because it's just a takeoff on the perfection loop, right? Right. Tie it, put it on your streamers. I think you'll see a big difference. I do a lot of stripping leeches in the driftless streams, and this is a great knot for those little stripping leeches, really get them to activate and move, which is what they need to do. My wife suggests I always put one picture of me in every presentation. That's it. No, I, I did improve it though. Okay, here's a few casts that you really need to know too. Okay, I think one of the most important ones here's an Iowa driftless stream is a slack line cast. Okay, this is a kind of uh, would apply uh, also a tuck cast would be very similar to this for nymph fishing, but this is a slack line cast, a very sharp forward stroke, and then you'll see the fly drifting down with slack in front of it. All right, the leader lands straight on the water. The fly floats gently. There's a little bit of slack right in front of it, but no slack here. That's what we're looking for. Here's another view of it, a slack line cast to create slack in front of the fly, but not all the way through the entire line. Bounces back, you get some shock waves. Look at the vertical drop to the fly. All right, the line is dropping horizontally, but that, that leader is coming down like this to give us the slack in front of our fly that we need. You also kind of similar cast for the tuck cast with nymphing, okay? Here's another one, the reach cast, I think is also another important one where we're just going to reach and put this uh, belly um, in the direction of our mend. And we can usually get away with fewer mends that way if you'll do that. And once you make cast in line, control is critical mend early and often and effectively so too often we just kind of drag our fly our line through the water and we move our fly but watch the mend here watch them rip it off the surface rip it up flip it up it's more of a flip than it is just a you know just kind of a, a it's not this arc it's a flip okay get a c going and then get that line off the water break the surface tension that's also a great way to pick up your dry flies too so you don't slurp it's called a spiral pickup just kind of give it a c and then then go to your cast and you'll avoid that slurping sound okay keep your line under your finger when you're doing your uh, when you're doing your present look at him recovering the line Line and uh, you know, keeping the slack in his line to a minimum. Okay, look at him do a few false casts over to the side. 
instance with false cast, do them to the side, then come over the fish and lay it down. They don't see it all. That's that New Zealand style indicator that we talked about earlier in class. I don't like these very well. Uh, I don't want to share all my negative biases with you, um, but I'm not a big fan. These are better, okay? But I do see, think this New Zealand strike indicator is the best. I like it because it's really a readable strike indicator um, where it's going to land sideways and then kind of go erect when the flies get tight to the strike indicator, telling now I've got connection to my, my uh, flies. And then it's going to slow down when my flies reach that strike zone and they begin to track at that slower speed. It's readable. So it goes upright when I've got connection to my flies. And then it slows slightly because it has a very small footprint there. And it, the flies will actually slow that down a bit. Um, I'm a big fan also of dry magic floating rather than some of the goops and pastes that we use. I like it because it will even go on CDC without smearing and gooping it up. It doesn't just turn into a gob of, of goo on the water. It actually um, repels water and it, it's a, a thin enough product that it doesn't uh, gum up your flies. So, and I also use a lot of dry powders as well um, on my flies. So I think one of the most important things that, that oftentimes has failed to overlook is the influence of water temperature. Okay, when, when, when the water temperature is below 50, you look for trout in a different position in the river. All right, they're going to be in, in the deeper, slower water. When that trout uh, temperature gets between 50 and 55, they move forward into more aggressive lies. You'll find them in riffles and things like that. Don't fish the riffles if the, if the temperature is 45. That's, that's too much exposure for them for the low return on, on the food that's available there. Okay, does that make sense? Water temperature tells you um, how aggressive the trout are, but also tells you where to look for them. Okay, winter lies and summer lies are much, much different. Okay, the importance of water temperature again is, is critical. Uh oh. Okay, but also when we tie our our dropper off of the, the shank, we're we're suspending our weighted dropper off the the least buoyant part of our fly. If you look at a parachute, all the buoyancy is up here. Okay. And by rigging this way, this will the dropper will descend and it will pull this part under water in direct connection to that and then we're suspending part of the hot fly which will hold that up better for us okay but also we get to do a lot more activation and animation of this we can do those shakes like jeff courier was doing in that one video and it shakes your nymph and now what i can do what he was doing here too is he can get it up out of the water Okay, the nymph is still anchoring our, our, our presentation, but our dry fly is above the water dangling, 
and I can dab it on the water like an egg laying caddis. Okay, I can skip it across the current and have it bounce off the current like an egg laying caddis or a mayfly getting trying to get up off the film piece that's called fishing the angle or fishing the dangle or more of this in the literature this stuff isn't out in the literature yet but we're doing a lot more dabbing and dangling of that because we're reading this way does that make sense i have a lot more influence in the quality of that presentation and the changes i can put into that presentation by rigging up that way okay and it just ends up with more fish in the net okay all right, let's do our hoppers. Where'd our young lady go? She went to take a break. Okay. All right, we're going to wrap up here because I know we're about out of time. Um, hoppers, ideally, we get a wet spring and a dry summer. That wet spring ensures a big hatch of the, uh, of the immature stages and development in that drier weather that we're getting right now pushes all those hoppers to the stream edge where the vegetation is more lush. And so we end up with a great hopper season. If it's a wet spring, ideally followed by a dry spell and we're in a dry spell right now. And then wait for the dew to come off. Our dew and our driftless streams could be there till noon. Okay, we really don't see the hoppers becoming active until the dew is off the grass. And not beetles that I use. Anybody use a beetle? Amy's ant, uh, Chernobyl's um those types of things i like them better because i can start the beetles now hopper season won't start for several more weeks but i can start beetles now okay because beetles are starting to get active late may and early june the japanese beetle those trouts will gorge on them okay when you're looking for beetle water i like to look for um they're not very good flyers like hoppers but i like to look for fruit trees something that has soft uh leaves um they like jewel weed um they they like raspberry patches, wild multiflora, anything where there's brambles and stuff like that that's close to the water. If you can see anything also um, that looks like that, hanging over the water, okay, put your beetle there. Okay, okay that's the, the, the leavings from the Japanese beetles, okay? And that season begins pretty close now. Streamer retrieves, not all streamer retrieves are equal. Here's Landon, we were fishing last summer up on his home waters. Look what he's doing here. And we'll finish up here. How about that? 827. All right, his first pass through here is just pulling it back through this nice transition zone. The second time he's changing his retrieve, pop, 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 pop. He's doing a different retrieve. Watch this here. And that's all it took on the second pass there, that little pop, pop, and you're hooked up. So again, don't just do the same thing mindlessly. Um, cast after cast, try to change something. If it's not working, change it. Do something different. I, don't, I think we better. I think we better close there. Bob, are we good? That's about eight thirty. We, we didn't get. We are good. I was just confirming one thing. So I, uh, I think this was a terrific presentation. We are out of time to do Q and A here in the room, uh, but I have two suggestions. Uh, so first of all, for the folks who are on Zoom, what I want to request is uh, just go and put something in the chat, or if you want to send me an email, I'll get all the questions together. And Jason, I hope that's okay if I send you those questions, if you could answer them later. And Jason has also told me that as long as people are willing to buy him beer, he's willing to answer questions. So I would recommend that we uh, adjourn the meeting a different location for those who have questions and want to sit and chat with Jason for a bit longer. Uh, but finally, before we go, we're starting a tradition at TCTU, and that is to recognize our guest speakers with a gift. So, Brian, do you have something for us? Oh, right here. The box that says Jason. Jason, thank you very much. We really appreciated it. I have a life member.